welcome back and welcome to those who have just joined us uh, to the second part of the webinar. My name is Belen Zapata Diomedi and I'm a Vice Chancellor Research Fellow at RMIT University in Melbourne. Before I start, I would like to acknowledge the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nations as the traditional owners of the land uh, on which I live and work. I respectfully acknowledge their ancestors and elders, past, present, and emerging. Also, um, I would like to say big thanks uh, to Laura Hidalgo, who organized this webinar in a very uh, short time, and also to the support of uh, Sasha, Aleish, Alberto, and Annie. Thank you very much for the presenters uh, for our first uh, part, Alex and Birch and Emily and Joe. Uh, your presentations were very interesting, so were the questions and answers. Um, it's great that we had such a good mix uh, from academia and also from the government sector. That was one of the aims of our webinar uh, to bring different players in transform health and designing healthy and livable cities. Also, um, today is World Bicycle Day, so we timed the webinar quite well. Um, we didn't really think about that, uh, but it's great that, that we have a day uh, for bicycles. I would also like to take this opportunity to well, share some good news. I'm part of a group of researchers uh, who recently got um, a grant from the National Health and Medical Research Council and the Medical Research Council in the UK. So uh, the National Medical Research Council is here in Australia to continue working in this field of transparent health and improving uh, the models that we already have and expanding our work. Um, James Goodcock will further uh, present information about our project when he speaks later on. And now I just would like to say that as part of the project, we are setting up a network of transport and health uh, researchers and practitioners, and also we plan for future webinars. When you register for the webinar, you were asked whether you would like to be part of this mailing list. And we will also ask you again when you exit the meeting. Uh, so it would be great to see many of you in our network. In the second part, I'm uh, sorry, I forgot to mention the name of the project. The project is called JIVE, Joining Impact Models of Transport with Spatial Measures of the Built Environment. And the lead investigators are James in the UK and Billy Giles Corti in Australia. Now, um, for this second part of the webinar, we will follow the same format where the speakers have 13 minutes for the presentations. And then we have five minutes for questions and answers. Please post your questions in the question and answers uh, function. And if you like some of the questions, vote for them so we can direct our attention to them. We've got uh, four great speakers. Again, Audrey Dinsali from Imperial College, Maria Jose Rojo from the Police Network, Alexander Santa Cruz from Safer City Streets uh, from International Transport Forum, and James Goodcock from the University of Cambridge. Our first speaker, Audrey, will be talking to us about reducing air pollution, making the case for a system approach. And over to you, Audrey. Thank you. Thank you very much. Let me go ahead and share my screen. There we go. There we go. That worked for everybody. Um, okay. All right. So uh, hopefully this works. I can't see myself anymore, so I'm not sure if this is working for everybody, but I hope it does. And I assume there'll be some notification if it doesn't. So um, thanks so much for inviting me to this uh, active transport. Ask to start video, start my video. There you go. Is that better? Mm. Does that work for everyone? I can't. I still can't see myself, but I guess we I, can I guess see. It, you can see me. Yeah, we That's can good. see. Good. Great. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. So thanks for inviting me to this really fascinating uh, webinar on, on active travel. And to start this this uh, uh, morning's uh, second morning session, I want to talk about air pollution. 
and making the case for a holistic thinking or systems approach in the way we address air pollution. So you might wonder first why air pollution, and I think I don't need to dwell on this. We all know how uh, air pollution is such a, a major burden uh, on our health. It kills more than 8 million people every year. It's all, uh, already surpassed smoking and of course uh, COVID-19 and, and our uh, current uh, issues so far. So uh, we know that it's an urgent problem that needs to be tackled, but why in a webinar on active travel? Well, uh, the first reason is that traffic contributes a huge chunk uh, to air pollution in cities, anywhere between 12 and 60% uh, of the particulate matter that you found in city, find in cities comes from traffic, and that varies from city to city and uh, from region to region. But the key point is that not only does it contribute a lot to the local air pollution, but it also is, the, in most cases, the biggest chunk of air pollution that cities can actually control. A lot of the air pollution comes uh, in cities from the outside, from agricultural practices, from shipping industry, et cetera. So uh, traffic is really one of the ones that, that uh, cities can control. But probably even more important that, contrary to most of the other air pollution sources, traffic is one that represents a really huge opportunity to be able to uh, bring many other co-benefits when you tackle it. Tackling uh, traffic, as we've seen in already in all the presentations this morning, we will continue seeing throughout the day, traffic contributes to many other of the major public health hazards from traffic injuries and noise and general stress and level of anxiety and grayness that we find in, in the cities. So tackling traffic provides opportunities to tackle something beyond just air pollution. However, when we talk about air pollution, when we think about addressing air pollution in cities and from traffic in particular, what do we focus on? We have a very narrow-minded view on focusing on technological solution typically to address air pollution. So some of the flagship uh, policies that are in place in some cities around the world revolve around the development of low emission zones or electrification of the vehicle fleets, all things that will simply change the type of vehicle, the type of technology that we use in within the same uh, vehicles. So once we've changed in those pictures that you see here, every single one of those cars and replace them with an electric car or a low emission car, are we gonna be much better off? Well, that's what we would do with our narrow-minded view of air pollution policies. And I assume you will agree with me that of course we can do much better than that. And if we were to, re if we were to replace uh, all these cars with walking and cycling, and public transportation, active travel, we will not only bring um, uh, air pollution reductions, but we will bring all these other co-benefits uh, to society, which we've already been talking about uh, this morning and we'll keep on talking about, and I'll say a few words about also. We create space and all, uh, also for kids to play, for people to socially interact, people to have picnics in streets, maybe even at least, in the, those warmer countries. But yet, this doesn't happen. We keep on having this very narrow-minded view. And when we address air pollution, we keep on having this very focused approach on, on technology in most cases. So why is that? Why is it that we can't integrate beyond uh, air pollution other considerations when we develop our, our plans, our city, our city planning? So much uh, uh, beyond this, how, why do we not integrate health in our city planning practices? Well, this is a, a big topic uh, in itself, um, and I'm sure Mark and Hanin will be happy to plug in a little publicity for their book. Uh, I reviewed the literature on why, uh, what are the barriers or enablers to uh, integrating health in planning practices, and the key um, things that I've identified as being barriers are one, as we all know, we tend to work in silos so that we uh, don't necessarily talk to each other, so institutional arrangements are a big barrier, and that leads, of course, to different understanding of what health is uh, or how we can address health. There's also leads to different understandings of what is evidence based, what is evidence and how we can use the evidence. And of course, these are absolutely essential issues in the, in the case of development of evidence because a lot of the evidence that we do develop doesn't, is not necessarily policy relevant. It doesn't help decision-making at the policy level. So there's a mismatch in the type of evidence base that's needed and what's relevant for policy. And that's absolutely essential because until we have, we're able to develop a policy relevant research, it will be very difficult to engage citizens 
society and politicians and to developing that political will, which is the bottom line of what's going to make anything happen, is to have the political will to, to make changes that are um, uh, drastic enough to, to see transformations in our cities. So what all this boils down to is really basically understanding how we might break our silos, how we might uh, create alliances across sectors of society, how we uh, encourage people, stakeholders, uh, of, uh, uh, various people and, and decision-making uh, powers to talk to each other so that we understand where we, we each come from and so that we can come together with a common vision of what's better overall for a healthy society. Of course, as researchers, we have a role to play in this um, and particularly in development of the evidence base. And uh, what I'd like to suggest is that we really make an effort to develop this holistic thinking in the terms of in, in, the, in how we develop this evidence base, we develop some holistic frameworks, some systems thinking models where we, we demonstrate uh, how choosing one alternative policy over another has holistically a, a, a a, good, a, a better impact so that it's not a narrow-minded approach. And I'm gonna show you just a very simple examples of some of the works that we've done. So it's not really systems thinking quite yet, but just shows that, that we, if we think holistically how different solutions might emerge. So the first example is work that we did in Barcelona where we did a health impact assessment study where we looked at the impacts of redu reducing car travel. So in this particular example, I'm showing you the benefits of reducing 40% of the car travel in Barcelona. And what we find is that if we just look at air pollution benefits, we find about 10 deaths avoided every year from this, uh, this measure of car traffic reductions. And of course, that's already a very good thing. But now if we, on top of that, not only reduce car travel, but we, we uh, assume that we shift these, uh, tr these trips to walking, cycling, and public transportation trips, then we find seven times the benefits thanks to the added physical activity benefit. So clearly, if we're able to show that if we have a very narrow-minded air pollution strategy and we compare it to something where we look at other types of benefits, we can make a very different case for different types of, of, of policies. And in this case, clearly active travel policies emerge as being much more beneficial than just looking at uh, air pollution strategies. Along the same line, uh, with some of my uh, master's uh, students and an ongoing PhD uh, project, We've looked at all the air quality uh, policies that are in the London air, qual air quality strategy and looked at uh, the benefits of these various strategies in terms of CO2 emissions, physical activity benefits, and air pollution benefits in terms of mortality benefits from air pollution reductions. And uh, those were all converted, in converted into uh, dollar terms or monetary values in pounds, actually. And what we did is we compared all the technological solutions that were in this uh, London air quality strategies and also some a bit more ambitious. Uh, so things like electrification of the vehicle fleets, uh, ultra low emission zones, et cetera. And we compared that to behavioral solutions, all to do with uh, shifting to walking, cycling and public transportation. And as you see, because of the physical activity benefits, which are in, the, in dark purple, we find much greater benefits from the behavioral solutions, of course, instead of the technological solutions. So expanding our horizons so that we're not entirely focused on just one thing at a time, clearly we see emerge uh, different types of uh, policies as being more likely to be beneficial uh, for our society and our health. So we've done a lot of work on air pollution and physical activity in particular, and uh, other uh, uh, people have, of course, modeled also uh, traffic injuries and uh, green space or noise, for example. But I think where we need to be uh, step back and think more carefully about is, in the end, what we need to do is engage society and think about carefully, what is it that's gonna be a hook? What is it that's gonna be engaging to, to different stakeholders, to different members of society so we can generate uh, this, this call to action, this, this movement, this vision, this common vision of creating healthier uh, uh, cities. And maybe for that to happen, we need to be thinking about what it is uh, that are types of outcomes that are gonna be helpful to engage uh, citizens in particular and different stakeholders. And some of these might not be so simple to capture. And I just thought I'd, I'd show you a, co a couple of examples of the work that we did in the PASA project to try to understand some of those uh, fluffier types of uh, outcomes, which might in fact be uh, more important in terms of gauging uh, members of society to create this, uh, this engagement towards active travel policies. 
So in the past I study, we surveyed um, uh, people, about 10,000 people across seven different cities in uh, Europe. And we asked uh, people about how they feel about their health, how they feel about their mental health, their stress uh, and social interactions, et cetera. And we asked about their, their, um, their travel habits. And what we find is uh, that uh, for people who walk and bike, the more they walk and bike, the better they feel about their health in a statistically significant way. Uh, well, as in other modes, we see no impact. The more you drive, you don't feel any better about yourself. You don't feel any better about your health. Same thing for stress, how you uh, how stress, stressed out you feel. The more you bike, the less stressed out you feel in a statistically significant way. Not the case for all the other modes. We also asked about mental health and vitality. Same thing. Active travel is associated with better feelings of mental health and energy. Not the case for the other modes. And then finally, um, loneliness, social interaction, those are things that are, I think in society very important right now, that uh, the goals that people want to achieve, sorry, my children behind. Uh, and what we see is that, again, uh, the more you bike, the less you feel lonely, the more you walk, the more you have social uh, interactions, more contacts with friends and family. Although in this case, also uh, car drivers and motorcyclists also have fewer uh, uh, reports of loneliness in a statistically significant way. But the important thing here is what is it that's going to be that's going to speak to people? What is it that's going to engage them? And we, I can keep on talking. Uh, in this case, we have obesity. Is that something that's going to be um, that's going to be of of value to people? I'm not going to go into the details in the interest of time. But just to finish more on. On the other types of outcomes, so active travel has direct benefits to people. But of course, what happens when we promote active travel, if we take out cars away from streets, then we create space for uh, public space and for green space. And green space will have benefits in terms of biodiversity, in terms of uh, heat, in terms of uh, uh, stormwater management, uh, and the list goes on, and mental health and well-being as well, of course. So all these things, again, is trying to identify what is going to create the alliances so that we can work together and form alliances towards that common vision of, um, of healthy cities. And uh, I, if you ask me, that healthy cities vision is definitely an active travel uh, vision. So we need, as researchers, to create this modeling of a holistic framework where we make these connections between all of these impacts so that they can be apparent and so that we can compare policies that, are, uh, that have those uh, uh, different goals but have uh, um, synergies and sometimes also trade-offs. So we need to be thinking about the, those trade-offs. But very importantly, I think we need to match these holistic framework systems thinking type of modeling and research developments also with understanding of what is it that's gonna hook, uh, that's gonna engage citizens, understanding citizens and stakeholders. What are their values? What are the objectives they're trying to reach? What's gonna motivate change? What are the barriers to, uh, to collaborations? How do we create those alliances that are going to lead us to this common vision? So to conclude, I'd like to suggest that we, uh, as, as researchers, uh, really strive to uh, implement the, the model that was developed uh, by uh, Billy Giles Corta and, and others uh, of co-creation, of including stakeholders at every stage of our development of research uh, from the research development of the research question to the methods and even what you do after the, develop, the the research is finished and how you engage in advocacy. But even more importantly, or on top of that, I think we really need to integrate within this process a very rigorous structure, structured uh, approach of decision-making so that we elicit values from stakeholders from citizens and we understand what are their objectives and we transparently include these values in our research approaches and in the policy decision-making process as well. So that we really uh, are able to transparently demonstrate that we've considered the, 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 the various benefits that are, are, are and the, the different objectives, and diff the different stakes that people have in decision-making processes. And so that together we end up coming up with uh, solutions uh, a much healthier uh, cities uh, for, for all of us. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Audrey. That was a very interesting uh, presentation. 
Um, it also caught my attention and we have a question from the question and answers. So you showed that the technological solutions um, don't fare very well with the simpler walking and cycling behavioral change solution in one of your slides. Um, can you expand a bit more um, on this one? Why, so I think it's why the technological solution are not generating the same benefit as the behavioral solutions? Is that yes, yeah, by far, yes. By far. So it's simply because in technological solutions and the, in the, the, the air pollution uh, uh, strategies that I've shown you, it's only about reducing air pollution. There are no other co-benefits. Now, of course, in a broader framework, you might think, okay, well, when we develop uh, technological solutions, then it might generate some economic activity, some innovations in, in certain sectors of the economy, which in, in themselves will have some co-benefits. So I'm not saying that there's no other co-benefit. There may be something. But I think in terms of, of uh, the direct impacts on, 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 the, on, on the cities and the, and the society, when you uh, encourage people to walk and bike, we know that uh, that physical activity benefits are just driving forces of, of health benefits. We've shown again and again and again in many modeling studies now, uh, the first one uh, being now, um, what, uh, ten, eight years ago, 10 years ago, eight years ago, or no, 10 years ago, we've been showing again and again how, how the benefits of, of physical activity are so, so, so much stronger compared to the air pollution um, benefits, especially in terms of the trade-offs, but also in terms of how we uh, address uh, the, the, yes, physical activity is just a very driving uh, force of benefits. Now, of course, again, I, in this case, I'm only looking at physical activity and air pollution in the models that I, sh I showed, but we could integrate a lot more, which would make even more the case uh, for uh, additional benefits. And then again, in, when I showed you the benefits of walking and cycling in terms of stress, in terms of, uh, mental health in terms of people's uh, self-perception of health, it's also given the current condition. But of course, if you create environments that are even less stressful for yes. uh, for walking and cycling, you would expect even greater benefits, you would think. Yes, definitely. Um, those were nice results, but yeah, it can be a bit stressful to cycle. Um, and I say from my experience here in Melbourne and also in Brisbane. Um, would you advocate for more health impact assessments then? Um, Yes, I think a health impact assessment definitely has a role to play. I, I, but I think the health impact assessment, we really need to make the case for it to be holistic so that we connect the dots, so that it's not just one thing at a time. Because I think we, we, we just like everything else in, uh, in the way we, we, we work, we still work in silos and we haven't, of course, there's a lot more effort right now to develop those health impact models that are, that are more holistic. But the, the next step, I think, is also to make sure that those health impact models mirror the, the, the needs that are voiced by citizens, by members of the public, by different stakeholders, so that they match what their values are, where their needs are, what, what, and, and, and allow us to compare alternative policies. If we want the health impact models to be particularly effective, they need to be complex to, to, uh, to be able to reflect reality. Policymakers need uh, uh, to see evidence that reflects their their own situation, which is a complex real life situation. So I think we need to develop, even though they're more difficult to uh, explain, I think we do need to develop complex models and they need to address specific uh, policies so that we can compare a variety of alternative policies and they need to uh, integrate the, the types of outcomes or objectives or values that are that that the decision makers care about that citizens who are going to vote for the, <laughs> the politicians care about and the different stakeholders that have a stake in those decisions uh, care about. Yeah, it's, it's definitely complex. Um, and also to what extent the other departments uh, think about health in their planning um, with this concept about that departments work in silos, but we all pay for the bad health outcomes. So they, they should be thinking more holistically. Um, exactly. Yeah, so well, thank you very much, Audrey. We're going to move on into our next presenter. Uh, thank you for your great presentation. And now uh, we are going to listen to Maria Jose Rojo, who is the project manager coordinator at Active um, Travel and Health at the Police Network. Maria Jose is going to be talking about post lockdown mobility planning. 
reallocation space to promote active travel. So very topical. Uh, over to you, Maria Jose. Thank you. Thanks a lot. I'm going to try to, to share my screen. <laughs> There it is. I hope you can see my 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 slide. Uh, not yet. Not yet. Okay. Um. Now yeah. we can. Okay. Yes. Great. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks a lot for the presentation and for the. The, the previous presentation, thanks. Well, all, very, all presentations have been very interesting so far. Thanks a lot. Um, well, I am going to speak about post lockdown mobility planning, reallocating space for, uh, to promote active travel. And as Belen said, I work uh, for Police Network. I will very briefly introduce the, the organization. Police Network is a, a network of European cities that working together for sustainable mobility and transport innovation. It's formed, it's formed by 80 members from small towns to big regions. And it works on different areas uh, such as peer-to-peer -peer exchange, policy, development, research uh, related to sustainable urban mobility innovation. We work mainly on these uh, five pillars. So on environment and health, on traffic efficiency, access, road safety and security, and governance and integration. And our main activities are working groups. Working groups is where several cities uh, gather to, to discuss about certain topics, to learn from each other, from their previous experiences, to, to, to share knowledge and to learn as well from, from the developments on certain topics. There are different working groups. For example, the one I'm working and leading on is active travel and health, but there are others on traffic efficiency, governance, etc. And um, we are also working on European projects. Uh, we, are, we, in, we help uh, our, the cities in our network uh, get on board these, these uh, European research projects, but we also participate as an organization. We, and we work uh, in policy and advocacy, so representing the voice of citizen regions towards European institutions. Uh, I will, in this presentation, I would like to speak a bit about how the, our response during COVID times has been, and I have uh, divided into three phases. So during lockdown, which we have been monitoring the actions that cities have been taking to keep things moving in their, in their cities. Then post lockdown mobility planning, so how, how cities have, um, are emerging and what kind of uh, mobility planning they are, they are they're putting in place. And uh, finally, a uh, future like uh, looking uh, in the long term, uh, providing strategic guidance and the latest activities we are, we are now working on. Well, the, as we know, uh, the, the, this pandemic has uh, brought very important constraints, imposed constraints in the urban mobility. And uh, as we know, public transport, which is the backbone of urban mobility systems, has now a uh, very reduced capacity, it has been mentioned already. And this is from a pers physical perspective, so as to maintain physical spacing separation, but also from a behavioral perspective. And in addition to this constraint, we also have a problem, which is that the space in cities is not designed, space, space allocated for, for walking is not sufficient to maintain social distancing requirements. This is, um, the, the, the crisis has, it's very obvious uh, that there's an unbalanced distribution of space in cities. So now, uh, and having uh, it, there's a there's a risk that uh, with the backdrop of decreased capacity in trans transports, there's a risk of uh, an increased uh, congestion after after the lockdown. But also, but also as it has been mentioned already, there are other pathways, and that th those are the pathways that we are trying to encourage. Uh, for example, boosting uh, active travel, uh, walking, cy cycling. And uh, during the lockdown, we have seen many, many cities putting these kind of measures in place. Uh, we, first, it were, there were dozens of cities, then it was hundreds. Now we are aware of more than 2,000 measures worldwide for, for respacing uh, cities in favor of walking and cycling. This is a, a photo of Berlin, which one was one of the 
the first ones to implement these kind of measures, but not only cycling infrastructure, but also widening sidewalks so that uh, spacing requirements can be met. Uh, this is Lambeth, London, who also came uh, to our meetings to discuss their, the measures they were putting into place. There are different kinds of uh, space relocation measures, uh, expanded uh, sidewalk, as we have seen in the previous photo, also emergency cycle tracks, a combination of both, but also other, other measures such as slow streets, where the, the car access is allowed, but not through traffic, and priority is given to pedestrians and cyclists, and speeds are below 20 kilometers per hour, and open streets, where the entire street is open to cyclists and pedestrians, but, clo but closed to, uh, to all but emergency or essential car access. Uh, based on, on all these, uh, we organized structured webinars with the cities of our network, first to learn about their post-lockdown mobility strategies, the ones that were more advanced and could share them with their peers, and also focusing on specific topics such as uh, uh, relocation of space, but others as well, like urban logistics, uh, parking, etc. And uh, well, some of the key themes uh, that emerged uh, uh, from these meetings were, of course, the, the reduced capacity of uh, public transport, uh, the encouragement of home office, uh, speed limits, uh, that walking and cycling should be encouraged, many things that have been mentioned as well already. The, the question, the specific question that we were, um, we, we were putting in place in our uh, meetings uh, on the topic of space reallocation is how can we redistribute space in our cities and capitalize on the active travel boom that has been experienced during the lockdown and how do we implement measures that we can keep, that we want to keep in the future and create more resilient mobility ecosystems and while uh, different issues emerged from these conversations related to technical specifications to administrative rules to legal considerations and I will very briefly uh, mention some of them regarding technical guidance. There's a lot of technical guidance already on how to deploy, for example, cycling infrastructure. Um, there, these are some examples of guidance. So we, so there's already material available to to ensure that that these uh, networks, although they, they are very quickly de deployed, they can be safe. Uh, this was something mentioned as well in 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 the meetings with cities that the, the materials are already available to deploy this kind of infrastructure. Of course, funding is a very important um, issue and we've heard, we've had uh, good news in this area. Of course, we need more funding to deploy this kind of uh, infrastructure. Engagement with citizens, and this is an example of an app developed by Sustrans, which is one of our members, to collect feedback from citizens on the different kind of space relocation measures that were being put into place in the UK. Behavioral change is a very good opportunity because uh, as, uh, we've, we've all experienced cities in another way and this can truly change our, our mobility behaviors and, and communication as well. And enforcement, which is also, it, it, it obliges us, uh, it, it's necessary cooperation with police and other stakeholders. And I would like to, to briefly um, share some of the experiences of the um, mobility plans, uh, post-lockdown mobility plans that were shared uh, in the last weeks. For example, Barcelona, as part of its post-lockdown mobility strategy, is implementing measures to make walking, cycling, and public transport easier and more convenient for citizens and uh, more space uh, for pedestrians will be created with uh, 12 kilometers of pedestrian priority areas, street cultures, street closures and uh, pavement widenings, and as well new bicycle corridors, 21 kilometers of new bicycle corridors. Also Milan shared uh, their, their post-local mobility plans to promote active travel with as well many measures to where pedestrians are giving the greatest priority, such as widening pavements, also tactical urbanism approaches, such as parklets, we can see a picture there, and closing streets to, to through traffic. Uh, Milan uh, also, also set an, a plan for new emergency cycle routes, which was already envisaged in the SUMP, in the Sustainable Urban Mobility Plan, approved in December 2018. And it envisages the construction of 35 kilometers of new cycle routes, 
uh, with over 22 kilometers uh, already by summer. And in combination with shared streets we were mentioning before. Brussels uh, has also an ambitious uh, post-lockdown mobility plan. It is based in the neighborhood approach, uh, which gives a greater priority to movement on foot and by bike to create more welcome, welcoming urban environments within the neighborhoods. And it's based on slow streets uh, where, where people can move more freely with speeds uh, up to 20 kilometers per hour. And it's also, there's also a plan for a citywide 30 kilometers hour standard speed for 2021. And this is combined with, with as well with a network approach uh, that you can see here, which combines uh, this, this cycling network to be developed in combination with the neighborhoods uh, that I was mentioning before. Also, Rome has a network approach uh, with the implementation of emergency cycle lanes of 150 kilometers. It's also based on the SOMP uh, bike plan. The first, way, the first 40 kilometers are already, well, are planned for the next months. And it also has a very powerful communication package based on Via Libera. And as well, Ile de France, this is just a, an overview of some of the, there are many more, of course, but Ile de France has a very ambitious, um, as a result of the COVID, a very ambitious plan for 650 kilometer cycle paths across the region. Um, with 250 kilometers of temporary cycle paths being implemented in the near, near future. And it, um, it replicates uh, the, the, the network of the train so, that, so as to be a real uh, alternative to public transport. The, uh, currently, the, the network developed is also being used to test and trial the network. Uh, just I would like to, to close uh, to mention that uh, the, European, the guidance from the European Commission on COVID-19 lockdown exiting uh, does mention active travel and it, it says that urban areas could consider temporary enlargement of pavements and increased space for active mobility options and that reducing speed limits of vehicles in increased active mobility areas could be considered. Uh, this was just on the 13th of of May that it was published. And uh, also very, very recent news is that we are now working at POLIS together with uh, other organization on a COVID-19 SOMP topic guide, which uh, tries to put this guidance from the European Commission uh, into practice. And this guide will be a practitioner briefing based on good practices all over Europe uh, with regards to active travel, but also with public transport. Um, and uh, well, it will include lessons learned, consolidated recommendations, and other comprehensive material. And uh, it's intended to be really practical and useful. And as closing thoughts, uh, I'd like to, to mention that we have seen that the rapid deployment of emergency cycling lanes is usually linked to long-term strategic planning that was already, but the, the pandemic has uh, make these plans uh, be implemented much quicker than it was planned. Of course, infrastructure is not everything, but it is essential to ensure pedestrian, pedestrians and cyclists are safe as, and feel safe. There is, of course, a strong link between the potential for active travel and uh, urban layout. Uh, complex, dense and compact urban fabrics uh, are more suitable for walking and cycling. Uh, we, but we must not forget about the role of cycling in intermodal mobility as well. And we, there, we must respect not just for mobility, but for urban livability in general, creating, for example, parks, uh, places uh, to, for children, etc. There's a need to empower local authorities. And uh, we have to make sure that even if these are emergency measures, we can build now what we wish to have in the future. So more, more sustainable and resilient mobility ecosystems. Thanks a lot. Uh, that was all. Thank you. Thank you very much, Maria Jose, for your very interesting presentation. There are a lot of initiatives going on around Europe and the world in terms of active transport infrastructures to support social distancing. And it seems a great opportunity to learn in terms of what works, and what doesn't, what are your views on this? I mean, it's still very soon, so we like to have, um, to know exactly what works, and 
or what not works. As I said, in many cases, it's plans that were already set up by cities. So it's quite safe in the sense that those plans were already approved and the, the crisis is just making the, the decisions go faster and these plans being implemented uh, faster than, than before. But um, in terms of, of good practices, this uh, COVID has brought like a huge experiment, the, the, the largest urban experiment maybe ever. So, so we will be analyzing uh, the, the best practices. And now some of the, the, the good practices that I've shared, I think are like very good examples of working towards more, more sustainable urban mobility ecosystems. Great, thank you. Um, there were some pretty impressive projects uh, by some of the city's members of the police. Do you have any insight about the factors uh, that led to these projects being approved by decision makers in these cities so quickly? As I said, uh, sorry, but it's the, the ones that have been quicker were the ones that had already, for example, in Brussels, uh, they had already the, the good move plan. So, yeah. uh, or for example, um, um, well, yes, I mentioned as well, pa pa Paris. Paris was already working before to promote active travel very strongly. So I think though that makes the difference. The cities that were already working on, on, the, on this topic, uh, the one- and, <laughs> Yes, and in terms of the temporary um, arrangements to create cycle lanes, are there any discussions in making them more permanent? Um, or this is just a temporary measure to support social distancing? Um, yes, uh, they are temporary, but when we were discussing, for example, with Berlin, they were they were mentioning this was intended, they are doing it temporary, and this, uh, of course, uh, has less, it's easier to implement these kind of measures, but they are looking to um, make this, uh, this infrastructure permanent for the city. So this, um, the, of course, not mm, the, the fact that they are temporary allows for trialing and testing and know what works well and what doesn't. So that's a, yeah. a good point for, for temporary, but the, the focus is to, to make these efforts uh, become permanent. And do you think that if there are health impact assessments of these interventions that might push the agenda a bit further, uh, to make them permanent, or what? What is the what? What has to happen for them to be permanent? Well, if you know, of course. Mm -hmm. I mean, there are legal issues and governance issues that are different for each city. So that's a very specific um, case for for each city. But of course, awareness raising and having the support of the citizens is uh, key as well. For example, we have we I showed these app which was developed by Sustrans, which is collecting a feedback on the different measures and this feedback goes directly to the uh, it, it, they make the connection as well with the local government so so i think uh, awareness raising and specifically uh, citizen support is key in these kind of uh, measures and as well berlin mentioned this that they had such a marvelous reaction to the cycling, cycling infrastructure, emergency cycling infrastructure, they were developing. So they had uh, even, even they received flowers <laughs> for, for development. So, I mean, there's a lot of, of support from, I think this is important as well. Yes. And in Europe, of course, you're going in, into the summer. Um, so that supports this boom in, in cycling. Whereas in other places like here in Australia, we're going into the winter, so it might be a bit more challenging mm -hmm. when it's time to go back to work. Uh, what people are going to choose, right? Yes, it, it is. I think climate is, a, is as well a very important factor and it has helped as well recently uh, in, in terms of the development of uh, cycling infrastructure. But I think it's much more important for people to feel safe and to know that they have their infrastructure, that they're they feel safe and that's, um, I think that's more important <laughs> even. Yeah, definitely. Well, thank you very much, Maria Jose, for your interesting presentation. Thank you.
Thanks. We're now going to move into the next presenter. Thank you. Okay. Um, yeah. I'm trying to. Let's just wait a little bit. Great. Uh, so our next presenter is Alexandre Santa Cruz, uh, who is the coordinator of the Safer Cities Streets at the International Transport Forum at the OECD. And today, um, Alex will be talking about preventing gross death through mode shift. And over to you, Alex. Yes, thank you. Uh, I guess you hear me now. Uh, thank you very much for, for the invitation. First of all, I, I really enjoy being here. It's an honor and I thoroughly enjoyed uh, presentations I saw earlier. Uh, please stop me if, if something is not working or if you don't see me, uh, but otherwise I'll start. Um, in this talk, I'd like to provide evidence that uh, shifting car trips to other modes can save lives. This sounds uh, already obvious to some of you, uh, but it is far from obvious to everyone. Many policymakers, citizens, parents believe that cycling is dangerous and that a car is the safest way to get around. Yeah, next slide. Before I start, what's the ITF for those who don't know us? We, we are part of the OECD, uh, but we are uh, an intergovernmental organization serving 60 member countries. In fact, we serve 60 transport ministers. We are a think tank for transport policy. We cover all transport modes from walking to shipping. We organize an annual summit, which is the world's largest gathering of transport ministers. So as you can understand, our scope is wide, but uh, topics related to road safety and active travel are far from neglected. I often very much like to show this illustration. This is from Transport for London, from the document Joe Stordi was talking about earlier. Uh, and in here you see that uh, safe streets make uh, people feel safer, therefore more confident to walk, cycle and use public transport. At this stage, uh, you already unlock a great deal of benefits in terms of physical activity, uh, but you also get a cascade of other benefits and a catalyst for a virtuous circle. People will use cars and motorcycles less often, reducing congestion and air pollution, but also reducing uh, the dominance of motor traffic and reducing danger. This is closing the circle. Uh, and I really like this illustration because it can speak to decision makers. How did we uh, collect evidence to, to back up our claims? Uh, the ITF created a network of road safety experts at city level, mainly from local government, uh, but also involving national uh, governments, academia and NGOs. Since our first meeting in Paris, we in total, we held six global gatherings like that. Uh, these are opportunities for cities to learn from each other. And we, we put a focus on uh, the value of data-driven uh, urban road safety policymaking. Uh, with this network, we have been able to collect road safety data from 31 cities around the world, from as far as Auckland, New Zealand, uh, and also working with the European Commission and their uh, European databases, we collected data on a further 41 uh, urban areas. You can find uh, already three publications on the ITF website, which are dedicated to urban road safety performance. Uh, you can download this material for free. Uh, one report here is in Spanish and uh, the most recent one is focused on European cities. Uh, but I'd like to add a little touch on micromobility in my presentation. So to explore the safety of e-scooters and micromobility as a whole, we held a workshop in Lisbon last year. Uh, we had a good bunch of people. We had four providers of shared micromobility services, uh, Bird, Cirque, Green and Voy. We had four cities represented. Uh, we had some of the best delegation from academia and a large number of private sector companies. Uh, 
Uh, these companies engage with the ITF uh, very closely and they support our research on innovation, on topics such as big data, on autonomous, autonomous vehicles. Uh, they make up what is called the ITF Corporate Partnership Board or CPP. Uh, and one such output of uh, CPB research is this report we launched uh, just in February, Safe Micromobility. In this report, we propose to define micromobility in a very flexible way uh, to be future-proof. We propose to include bicycles in it even. Uh, we propose to define micro, a micro vehicle as one with a maximum speed, no higher than 45 kilometers an hour, and with a mass no higher than 350 kilograms. As you can understand, with those two criteria combined, uh, our goal is to limit the kinetic energy of what can be called a micro vehicle. Uh, but this creates a wide definition. We acknowledge that. Many people believe that a 350 kilogram uh, vehicle is too heavy to be called micro. Uh, we simply, in response to that, we simply propose to separate different classes of speed and mass in a way, again, which we intend to be future proof. But uh, you all want to know if micromobility is safe. Uh, so we looked at the risk of death and uh, with regards to the risk of a rider being killed, controlling for the number of trips, we found no difference in risk between uh, cycling and using an e-scooter. Uh, and by e-scooter here, we mean uh, the low speed and low mass category of micromobility. We're not claiming that the whole of the micromobility family is as safe as cycling. Uh, but we also found that the risk of being killed is five times higher on a motorcycle. Uh, so this uh, reflects some of uh, what uh, Joe Story was presenting earlier, that uh, the, the real source of danger is, is more uh, in speed. In a nutshell, speed kills. Limiting the speed of micro vehicles to the speed of a bicycle, uh, such as 20 or 25 kilometers an hour, could make them as safe as a bicycle. So how safe is it to cycle? Today is the World Bicycle Day. Uh, let's map out the risk of you being killed per kilometer you cycle in different cities across the world. We've done that map using the ITF Safer City Streets database. Uh, and we found that places like uh, Copenhagen and Vancouver are some of the safest cities in the world for cycling. It shows uh, a lot of differences in the risk level across cities. Uh, we present it as room for progress. Uh, but what about uh, differences across modes? How does cycling compare with other modes? Uh, so we, we saw already some uh, very good work from Joe Story from Transport for London earlier. Uh, what we're doing now is presenting an aggregated view across five cities. Uh, so we are showing the risk of being killed per unit distance. Uh, it's the blue bar. Uh, it shows that sitting in a car for one kilometer is 10 times safer than walking the same distance. If I can find the highlighter here, the laser pointer here, here's passenger car, here's walking, 10 times more dangerous. This is something Bert was saying at the very beginning of the day. Uh, and we totally agree with that. Um, so why don't we promote car use uh, on road safety grounds? Uh, because the blue bar um, give an incomplete picture. They do not account for the harm caused to third parties in other road, use, road user groups. Uh, only when we account for that by stacking these gray bars, uh, can we picture the true impact you have when driving in a dense urban area? Uh, the likelihood of hurting vulnerable road users, uh, this is here, is far higher than the likelihood of hurting yourself, which is that. So could this chart help assess the benefit of mode shift on road safety? We think it's a good start. Uh, but some would argue that uh, we use the wrong metric because uh, this is fatalities per kilometer. Uh, people embrace uh, new mobility patterns. They go to, to different 
the places as they shift mode, as they reduce their reliance on the car, uh, they reduce the total distance they travel. So risk per trip would be at least as good a metric as risk per kilometer. Uh, we acknowledge there is a debate here. So we produced also the analysis uh, in terms of risk per trip. Uh, again, the risk of being killed is greatest when riding a motorcycle or a moped. This is here, the first bar, uh, we had to cut the axis. Uh, so shifting such trips uh, towards uh, cycling, uh, e-scooters or walking uh, would save lives. Uh, but if you account now for uh, fatalities in other road user groups outside of the vehicle, um, we see that a car trip causes in total more harm than uh, a pedal cycle or an e-scooter trip in a dense urban area. This is where uh, we reach a conclusion. Uh, our research makes the case for a mode shift towards walking, cycling, low speed e-scooters and public transport. And this case here is only built on road safety ground. Uh, our goal here is not to create a silo where we only look at road safety. Uh, it is just uh, an experiment to look at uh, what's the effect of mode shift uh, if you look only at road safety. The benefit is that this case uh, is not vulnerable to or sensitive to assumptions on the uptake of cleaner electric cars or a clean electricity grid. Uh, so it makes it more, uh, more robust, we think. Uh, we hope this can help policymaker to reallocate space in cities to facilitate mode shift. Uh, and especially now with the COVID-19 situation, cities like uh, Bogota, Milan, Brussels, just to mention a few, um, as Marie-José was doing just earlier, uh, are making radical changes in the use of public space. And if you want to read more about the need uh, to redistribute road space in response to COVID, uh, and if you want to see uh, some of the illustrations presented by Marie-Josée earlier, you can find uh, the latest ITF briefing in the COVID series. It is called Respacing Our Cities for Resilience. I'll try to share that on the chat. This was my last slide. I'll be happy to try and answer your questions now. Here are my details if you wish to continue the conversation offline. And thank you very much for connecting and listening. Thank you very much, Alex. Very interesting presentation. Uh, we have a couple of questions in regards to scooters and uh, not just looking at death, but injuries. How do you see the risk that e scooters uh, represent for other users, such as pedestrians? You know, it can get a bit messy uh, if the scooters are using the footpath and yeah, right, they go uh... faster. I'm, I'm very grateful for this question. It's an excellent one because uh, protecting people walking should be our absolute priority. I just didn't have the time to put that all in the slideshow. Um, our research on e-scooters shows that um, less, typically everywhere you look in the world, less than one in 10 victims in e-scooter crashes is a pedestrian. So that is significant, but that is certainly less than uh, what some people believe uh, e-scooters are, are, are not the the huge threat they are often depicted as and where they are a threat it's often where they are used on sidewalks and why are people riding an e-scooter on sidewalk uh, you probably know the answer because there's no safe space on the street to yeah. use them so yeah um, in fact, we, we address this, uh, this question in the report, Safe Micromobility. Thank you. Yes, I was thinking about that too. I mean, where, where do you ride it? Um, and also the graphs that you show um, do make differences in between age groups and gender. Um, can you comment on that? Right, yes, I chose not to, to show the analysis on age and gender here um, because I wanted to stick to a to, to simple point. Um, when you look at age and gender, you often have, you create more difficulties because you don't necessarily have the means of collecting all the exposure data by age and gender. 
uh, I know Transport for London does that uh, in an excellent way, but you know how many cities in the world are capable of doing that? Not so many. And so I, I don't see many points to make by age and gender in terms of risk. We know that young people take more risks. We know that older people are very uh, fragile. Uh, and despite them not taking any risk, they, they get hurt very badly when they do get hurt. Um, so I would, uh, I'm, I'd be happy to answer specific questions on age and gender. Uh, yeah. Great, thank you. Well, that sometimes when I go to transport and health or urban planning conferences, the, what they're saying is that cities should be designed for an 80 year old and an 80 year old to walk um, right. around safely. Um, so it yeah. should be safe for all. Yes, this is an, an excellent uh, uh, thing in the checklist of policymakers and designers. If the infrastructure is not safe for, for people of all ages and all abilities, uh, then it's probably not safe enough. Yeah. And um, what do you think that we can learn uh, from the recent data that we see in changes in uh, mobility from the COVID lockdown and social distancing? and the changes that we see in injuries, is there any lessons that we could learn? Um, just following right. up on Joe's point that cars might be going faster. Yes, the fact that cars are going faster is, is clear so far. We are uh, currently collecting evidence uh, on that across all the cities, member of the ITF Safer City Streets Network. I, we're doing that uh, together with uh, Bloomberg Philanthropies and, and their networks of, of cities working on road safety. And we will report on that uh, in the summer. Uh, now, what to do, what to do about it? Uh, I think if we were capable of addressing the problem of speeding at night, which was mentioned by Joe earlier, then we would be able to address the problem of speeding during lockdown. Uh, it is just revealing our failure to control for speeding at night. Yeah. Uh, in terms of, of behavior change since uh, the COVID situation, um, what's I'd like to, to make two points. One is that people often need a trigger to change, to, to take the, the old bicycle out of the cellar and to clean it up and to use it again. They need a trigger, they need a constraint, let's be honest. Uh, we have experience of that in London with um, public transport strikes. They help people adopt new modes of transport or change the route they take to, to go to work. Uh, and my second point um, is that, unfortunately, this could, this could disappear. People will need, uh, will need an incentive to keep on cycling and to keep on walking. They need a proper infrastructure. They, they, need, they need support. Definitely. Thank you very much, Alex, uh, for your talk and addressing our questions. We're now going to move into our next presenter, James uh, Woodcock from the University of Cambridge, who is going to be talking about transport and health modeling. Next step. Thank, thanks. Over thanks. To you, James. I'm sharing the wrong, sorry, I'm sharing the wrong screen. Okay, I hope that's working for people now. Thank you. So I'm going to be talking about the Jai project. We weren't able to announce this when uh, the, the information was sent out but thankfully we, we, we now can. So it's, it's an opportunity to talk about um, that project and how we're using that to uh, take forward transport and health modeling. Sorry, James, can you put the presentation mode on? Are you not seeing it? Oh, we see the editing mode. We could see it just on the editing mode. Is that correct? 
Yes, it's showing the next slide, uh, but it's better. Is that showing the presentation view or not? Yes. With the next slide. Oh. That's better than before, so we might do with that. How's that? That's good. Thank you. Okay. First, I wanted to put uh, some of this in context. Um, we've obviously got a lot of people from Australia here and we haven't had anything quite as bad as the uh, devastating fires that um, ravaged across a lot of Australia earlier this year, but the UK is not immune from the impacts of climate change and in February, a lot of England and Wales saw more than uh, four times the average annual rainfall with massive floods. My parents' house was flooded. And during May uh, recently, what we've seen across much of the south of the country is less than 20% of the average rainfall. And um, if this continues, we will be having a, a, a drought looming. So we must always think about the context of climate change with the work that we're doing. So JIBE is joining impact models of transport with spatial measures of the built environment. It's a three-year project just started and it's a collaboration between the UK and Australia with joint funding from the National Health and Medical Research Council of Australia and the Medical Research Council of the UK. So a great chance to bring uh, to, to work together on this. And this means that there are two project teams, one from each country, and we're lucky to have uh, Professor Billy Giles Courty leading the Australian team, uh, while I lead the UK team. Unfortunately, I don't have time to uh, go through all the great co-investigators they have. Sibelen is an investigator on the project, and Audrey, who just spoke earlier. So this project is building on and improving work that we've been doing separately, the two teams have been doing separately, and Australian colleagues have done a lot of work researching the spatial distribution of measures of urban livability and looking at the relationship between the built environment and transport behaviours. And specifically, I want to highlight the project Creating Livable Cities in Australia, where they measured livability across residential addresses in Australia's capitals. Well, over in the UK, we've done a lot of work developing models to simulate the health risks and benefits of transport mode shift. In particular, I want to highlight the project MetaHIT, which is a methodology uh, project, and this is an ongoing study that will finish next year. So to Jai, to bring these things together. The problem is that in England, these impact models that we've developed have not been linked to um, these built environment measures assessing livability. While in Australia, these built environment measures assessing livability have not been linked to um, state-of-the-art health impact models. So JIBE is an opportunity to, to integrate these two different approaches. And just to explain what I mean by some of these, these ideas, I know, come up in some of the earlier talks, but build environment, we're talking about things like density, population density, diversity, mixture of land use, the accessibility of different kinds of destinations, uh, the ease and the distances to transit, public transport, and the design infrastructure, the cycle tracks, the pavement side, side, sidewalks, the, the, the junction design as well. Transport behaviors, of course, we're talking about walking, cycling, smoker mobility, tran tran transit, public transport and driving. And health exposures, we're thinking about physical activity, air pollution, traffic injuries, noise, which is an important uh, impact and access and um, use of green space. And then the health outcomes, of course, there's many different health outcomes 
including cardiovascular diseases, many cancers, dementia, uh, and also mental health outcomes as well. One of the things that we're striving to do, building, building on work that Billy has been doing and linking to some of what Audrey was saying earlier, is going for a co-design, a co-creation approach. And in the UK, we're lucky to already have um, support from the Department of Transport, Public Health England, Transport for London, um, Joe's, uh, and Transport for Greater Manchester. And so this means we can ensure that stakeholder objectives and values are transparently integrated in the research. And we will be creating these policy and practice advisory groups in both countries, chaired by a local policymaker or practitioner to provide insights into policies, to advise on research activities, uh, to assist in communication of the research and to act as champions within their organization and uh, partner organizations of the research. Just to say now briefly something on the work that they've been doing in Australia and creating livable cities in Australia project. So these measures were created for every home in Australia state and territory capitals. And they did this across different domains, walkability, public transport, open space, housing affordability, employment, and the food and alcohol environments. They identified livability indicators associated with health and well-being. And these indicators have now been adopted across governments at different uh, scales in Australia. Related work is now going to be done for England, focusing on uh, measures that relate to transport behaviours. So we're going to look for measures looking at national guidance, the city region planning standards, and things that are of emerging policy and public interest. We're going to look for measures that have previously been associated with transport behaviours. And these built environment measures are then going to be calculated at the postcode level across all of the 11 city regions in England. And this will be a significant new data set. Um, we hope it will be useful for both for ourselves, but for, for, for other projects and for practice as well. Then the next step will be to link these built environment measures to transport behaviours. So we will develop statistical models linking these measures of the built environment to travel behaviours using data from our uh, National Travel Survey. And then we will be able to identify policy relevant and evidence uh, informed measures that are associated with the different transport behaviours, particularly how to increase active travel and reduce private car use. This will then be used in the project to inform the matching process for developing a synthetic population for the whole of England, which I'll explain in a minute, and to derive built environment scenarios so we can estimate uh, if there's a change in the built environment, how travel patterns may then change. Talking now about the synthetic population for England, what we're going to do is create a population of synthetic individuals for every city region. This will be done by combining multiple data sources on different individuals. So it's not the same individual, that's why it's a synthetic population, it's different individuals, including travel to census data on travel to work, national travel survey, and active lives survey on non-travel physical activity. Having a synthetic population of individuals means we can look at individual level data on exposures and behaviours, allows us to have heterogeneity in responses to interventions, and allows us to look at inequalities. We have an experience of developing synthetic populations for England. This is going to go further in Jive than we have done before. You're seeing uh, is a slide from the propensity, an image from the propensity to cycle tool. And in that, we've already developed, Anna Goodman's developed a, um, a synthetic population for England and Wales. But this is based on commuting data and travel to school 
Um, and so only doesn't have other trips in it. So it's limited in what it includes. In the ongoing MetaHit project, what she's been doing is including non-commuting travel. So all the other trips, 80% or so of the trips that people do. But at the moment, this is aspatial. So we only have area level estimates of how, um, rather than specific routes along with which people are traveling. In Jive, what we'll be doing um, with our built environment measures is developing more realistic representations of current travel patterns by including uh, them as predictors. And by including travel routes, um, we're we going to include travel routes by assigning origins and destinations informed by points of interest. And I'll explain in some of the next slides why that's important or what value that's going to add. Um, and we see this approach as being a balance between developing full travel demand modelings, which are quite resource intensive, and the kind of aspatial modelling, which has been the norm within a lot of transport and health modelling approaches. I'm now just going to talk briefly about some of the pathways that we're, we're modelling and some of the improvements that we're making. So physical activity uh, is associated with um, many different health outcomes, and we're going to be using information from a new dose response meta-analysis that is very nearly completed. And many, many health outcomes, as they say, are, are associated with different physical activity levels, ischemic heart disease, stroke, heart failure, multiple cancers, type 2 diabetes, but also things like Parkinson's, depression, and, and, and dementia as well, that maybe less, um, people may be less familiar with. And this is some preliminary results, cardiovascular disease and our dose response meta-analysis. And what you're seeing here is the relative risk of developing cardiovascular disease and the marginal meta-hours per week is the exposure, which is a measure of the volume of physical activity that people do in a week, combining um, it, it, the intensity and the duration of the different activities. And roughly this lower point here with about a 15% reduction in risk, would be associated with, with doing about one and a half hours per week of walking, or this higher point here associated with about 30% reduction in risk would be associated with doing about two and a half hours per week of cycling, cycling being a more intensive activity um, than walking. So you're getting more physical activity per hour of cycling. We're also, going to be including hilliness within it. We've already implemented estimates for hilliness within the propensity to cycle tool, both for bikes and for electric assist bikes. And what we've studied within that is we know that we've got data to show how um, we've done it for cycling, we also do it for walking, how hilliness reduces the likelihood that people are going to, to walk or cycle. But of course, if you are walking or cycling in it, um, in a hilly environment, then you are expending more energy, so that the the, uh, the health benefits will be great if if you are active. Obviously, a bit's been talked about traffic injuries. I'm now going to just say a little bit about how we have been modelling them and we'll be modelling them in the Jai project. So in MetaHip injury model, what we do is we regress the observed casualties, deaths, major injuries, and minor injuries against observed travel. And as Joe and Alex have been talking about, we include both victim, victim travel, but also other vehicles. So we're accounting for the fact that, say, a motorcyclist poses a risk or faces high risk themselves, but they also pose a risk particularly to pedestrians. And uh, we use national data and link the different areas together through a hierarchical um, statistical model. Um, and this model requires information on both person travel and also vehicle travel. So the synthetic population gives us information about how people travel, but we also need data on vehicle travel. And we get that from traffic counts, from transport statistics, and so, and so on. And one of the, the challenges is how to combine these different sources of data. And just to illustrate here that travel surveys um, 
which, which use a lot of health impact modeling. They account for people, the bus passengers here you see, um, at their trips and their mode. But it doesn't give you information on the driver of the vehicle. And of course, things like the age of the vehicle, the, the age of the driver or the, the, the gender of the driver, men being higher risk than women, is going to um, affect the likelihood of a collision. And it doesn't tell you about the vehicle. And of course, who's driving and the, the characteristics of the vehicle are going to affect the emissions and they're going to affect the traffic injury risk. So in, in Jive, um, we're going to be able to, we're improving our spatial representation as well. Uh, this is what I was talking earlier about the, the routing by modeling on which streets uh, vehicle and person travel will be changing. So this will give us both more accurate results, but also it's going to allow us to look at population variability much better. We also hope to be able to do some of the work looking at how uh, the COVID related changes in travel by mode and by speed of affected injuries, um, which, which could give us some better parameters for our models in the future. This is from, and I think Joe mentioned the Mini Hollands earlier in London. This is, these are pictures of before and after from the Mini Hollands in Waltham Forest. And as you see, a very big improvement in the uh, the, the livability and the, the, the environment here following the, the interventions. And uh, one of the advantages of our micro simulation population with the routing of trips is that we can give much better estimates of, instead of just saying an average estimate of traffic is reduced by this amount, this has this impact on um, the risk of injuries. We could say, well, on these streets, these people who are traveling on these streets would have this kind of change in reduction. And then if there's perhaps more traffic somewhere else, well, the, these streets would have more traffic, so there may be uh, increases or, or, or changes in those areas. So it can give us more accurate answers and account for who might be the winners and in some cases who might be the losers as well. In talking about air pollution, um, background concentrations, what we're doing is we're modeling changes in both PM 2.5 and NO2 and we're going to be deriving or we are deriving these impact factors and Audrey's been working a lot on that and what these impact factors are is kind of relatively simplified relationships that can be applied at scale looking at the relationship between pollution contributions attributable uh, what pollution attributable vehicle tra traffic divided by the amount of traffic in the bar so we can estimate, well, if there's a change in traffic uh, in an area, then how much will the pollution change without having to run a full air pollution dispersion model, which is quite time consuming for every scenario. And we're doing some of that in Resi and MetaHit, but in Jive, we're going to be improving the generalizability of this approach by analyzing the, the factors that affect these location specific traffic to concentration factors. So these will then hopefully be better better able to apply these to more areas. It's also important when doing air pollution, to, um, and this was mentioned by um, Bert er earlier in, in the day, thinking about person-specific exposure. And here, of course, you need to know the background concentrations in the area and how those are changing. But you also need to think about the route. And if you're traveling on a quieter route, the cyclist or pedestrian, you will have a lower exposure than if you're uh, traveling on the main road. But then there's the ventilation rate. And this is very closely related to the level of physical activity. And of course, the more you're exercising, the more you're breathing in, so the more pollution you're exposed to. Now, in most environments, for most people, the physical activity benefits will still be greater, but it is important to account for that. And then um, cyclists are perhaps more exposed than pedestrians because they're likely to be a bit closer to the traffic, closer to the, directly closer to the, the tailpipe than, than a pedest pedestrian is. Noise. It's important that we're including noise because this has not been included in many of the studies uh, of health impact modeling, but the, the, the harms are really quite substantial. So the evidence is, is more recently established, but what it shows is independent effects, not just to, not just to sleep disturbance, cognitive impairment, uh, loss of uh, abilities to, to learn and so on, but also to cardiovascular disease. So to, to hard health endpoints as well. 
And as with air pollution, we're generating impact factors on the relationships between changes in traffic and changes in noise levels. So hopefully we can then apply these relatively simplified relationships um, across different places. And just coming to the last couple of slides now, one of the uh, major developments we're doing in Metahit and then also taking forward in Jive is using value of information analysis and making use of uncertainty. And so, of course, health impact model results are uncertain due to uncertainty in the structure of the model and due to uncertainty in the different inputs that, that go into it. Value of information methods combined with Monte Carlo simulation provide a way to quantify the uncertainty and potentially to prioritize future research. So uncertainty can actually help us here. And what we can do with the value of uh, information is we can see how much an improvement in um, improved information uh, um, and how much, uh, what we can see is how uncertainty in each model parameter influences uncertainty in results. So if we reduce the uncertainty in a parameter, how will that reduce our result uncertainty? And that's gonna be different for different parameters. And this can guide future data collection and model improvements because we might see that some uncertainties matter a lot and something, even though it's very uncertain, may not have much effect on the results. Um, and what this is really important for is testing if the evidence for policy choices is robust. So it's not just a matching saying, well, our result is uncertain, we can produce ranges of uncertainty around this, but would it make a difference to the choice? Uh, if you're considering option A or option B, is your choice robust to the uncertainties that we have within the model? And that is probably um, the, the, most important, um, the most important thing we can see is, is not, how uncertain is it, but would it make a difference to what you choose to do? In summary, finally, the Jive brings together uh, research linking the built environment and transport behaviors um, with, with methods that we're continuing to develop in the health impact modeling of transport. And some of these key issues in the methods that I think it's important to take home is, the choice of pathway, um, adding to what Bert was saying earlier, things like noise, things like green space, which I didn't have time to go into, uh, are these things going to be included as well as the physical activity, the injuries, the air pollution? What's the spatial scale? Can you represent some of these smaller scales and even these street level interactions that, 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 that matter? Can you look at individual characteristics and inequalities? And some of these ideas about developing these simplified relationships, which can be applied more efficiently uh, without having to run very complicated, very time consuming models. And then given this adds to our uncertainty with many sources of uncertainty, can we make use of this? Can we investigate the uncertainties and see what's, what's most crucial for decision-making using methods like value of information analysis? Thank you. Thank you very much, James. Um, you are the last presenter, just to let those on the other side know. Um, we have a couple of questions. Um, what do you envisage as the main challenge to work with policymakers and practitioners? Uh, you mentioned that that's the approach at the beginning of your presentation. Sorry, I can't hear the one. Oh, sorry, should I repeat the question? Yes, please. Um, what do you envisage um, as the main challenges for this project in working with policymakers and practitioners? And uh, that's the, one of the focuses you mentioned at the beginning. Yeah, and I mean, maybe um, Audrey might want to, to come back to that as well as we, um, if we've got a little bit more time in the discussion. Um, I mean, there, there are many different, obviously, challenges to working with to policymakers, to different, to different stakeholders. It's often um, a challenge to understand the level at which you need to engage people and how you engage with people at different levels. Because there's decision making all the way from the people working at implementing a project, making the final tweaks on it, who are maybe even be seen as decision, decision makers. But 
their, their decisions to perhaps compromise at the end of the day on a cycling and walking scheme, scheme can make a, make a big difference to whether it works in practice through to the minister um, who is perhaps only going to, you know, have very, very small interaction with um, is it, you're going to be seeing things at a, at a, at a very different scale. So it, it's thinking about um, how to interact with people at, at different scales, at different levels, what are the different kinds of decisions that they make. And then it's about trying to think about how to build ongoing relationships and one of the challenges there can be the turnover of staff, both with the civil servants, the people who work for the government, who often move around for, for, in different roles um, and may not be familiar with all the, the things you've been working with the previous civil servant on, and then with the minister, ministers as well, and certainly within in, in, in the UK, traditionally transport ministers and the, the more junior transport minister who has the responsibility for a, active travel, the, is um, often these posts are um, have relatively high turnover. So, so even if you can get engagement and perhaps there's often a lot of people trying to, to go through these arguments on act, 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 active travel with, with, the, with the junior, junior ministers, uh, but then you may be getting a new, a new per person coming along. So I, I, I would see some of these as some of the main challenges. Yeah, thank you. And um, do you and your team have visited tool available uh, for others within the government or interested parties to to use these methods to measure the impacts of transport the comprehensive approach I mean, one of the challenges always is that re research count research council funding um, funds work with policy makers maybe and it certainly funds the research but it, it doesn't always provide the extra money that you need to develop kind of pol policy relevant tools now we do have tools that we are using with policymakers such as the propensity to cycle tool. Um, and we will be working to certainly improve and take some of the methods from the tool and make them available for, uh, for from the project to make them available for, um, for use in the kind of more widely, um, widely disseminated tools. And I think this is one of the things we're looking at with say the impact factors. It's not always just, you may have things you're doing in research and they may not always be able to use exactly the same approaches in policy and in practice. But if you can develop an understanding of relationships, um, then you can perhaps develop more simplified approaches, which you can test are robust in the more uh, academic models. And then these can be taken and applied in the, the tools and the, the um, the guidance approaches that, that are used in practice. Because um, even if you develop your own great new tool, people may have their own ways of working, their own tools that they want to use. And so often it is about thinking how you can fit in with how people work, um, rather than just saying, we've got something great and you, 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 you're going to use this because they might go, well, I've already got something I'm using. Can we improve, improve that instead? Um, thank you. Well, then on that, we must just uh, move on. Thank you, James, uh, to some questions to all the presenters um, and then to finalize uh, the session. So, Maria Jose, if you're still online, um, yes. we also wanted to ask, thank you, um, whether data is being collected um, on the interventions that are happening within the police network, for example, behavior data on walking and cycling? Um, well, we are collecting data well, on the different measures that are being uh, implemented all over Europe. Uh, cities that are implementing um, new measures are reinforcing their monitoring systems in order to better understand how these measures are affecting um, mobility behavior. So, but this is an ongoing process. Still, there's not a sufficient overview, but yes, cities are making efforts to, to monitor the, the effects of some, some cities, the effects of their measures. And we are collecting all the available data. We're planning to do this in a more structured way through the guidance document that I mentioned just before, which has just been approved. So through this process uh, and shaping these guidelines, and um, we intend to, to, yeah, to, 
to create more more structured recommendations. Great, thank you. Yeah, it seems a fantastic opportunity to follow up on behavioral change. And um, Audrey, would you like to expand on the question that I made to James about the challenges of working with policymakers and practitioners, or what, what do you envisage as challenges? Thank you. Yeah, I'm glad you repeated the question because I had an interruption for my children just as you were asking the question over to uh, to James. So I mean, I think I think James's response is 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 quite right. I think the challenges is going to be uh, things like turnover, and it's also the the stakeholders, people particularly who work in government agencies, are completely overstretched. And and no matter how much they see benefit in the research that that we develop, it's going to be very difficult for to convince them that their the time they invest in participating in research is going to be worth their time. So I think we have to make a very convincing argument that uh, that what we would like to offer is something that's going to be beneficial that they, they, they should be embracing. So I think um, uh, there's a lot of more technical challenges of how you elicit values, how you monitor, how do you develop performance measures on, on what those uh, objectives should be. There's, there's, it's complex and all, for all sorts of reasons. Uh, and uh, I think the, the work that we're doing in, in uh, Jibe on developing value of information, which I think is, a, again, is something that's essential to be able to, uh, uh, if, if you elicit uh, people's values, we need to be able to assess whether, and we can include them in the modeling framework, whether it's worth including in a modeling framework, given the current uncertainty, what will it add to the model? And all these things are gonna be very challenging in terms of technicalities, but the very basic thing of engaging with the stakeholders, getting them to be on board, just because of their own time challenges, it's, it's, is, is, gonna be, is, is gonna be quite tremendous. But we'll make yeah. a very convincing argument that they'll gain a lot from participating in our research. Definitely. And then we have another webinar to discuss uh, the story, the outcome. Thank you very much, Audrey. And um, now I would like um, to thank all the speakers. We have a great um, couple of sessions today with a really good mix of speakers from academia, uh, the government sector, and intergovernmental, sorry about my accent, organizations. And this was one of the aims of the seminar. So it, it's great to, to see that we, we could achieve this. And for those who are in, the, in Europe and North America, doubt that you're online now, just want you to remind that there's a second part uh, to this webinar happening today at 5 p.m. Barcelona time. And we have, um, again, a range of presenters from academia and the government sector, including Rolf Mockel from the Technical University of Munich, uh, Susan Handy from the University of California, Davis, uh, Kelly Clifton from Portland State University, Neil Malish from the Center for Climate Change and Health, and Thomas Goshi from the University of Oregon, Rachel Adred from the University of Westminster, Stephen Gosling from Land University, and Veronica Sanchez from the Barcelona City Council. Also, uh, for um, if you're interested in listening to their presentations or sharing them, we will be sending you the link um, in a day, um, I was told. So you, you can share uh, or listen to the great speakers again. And I would like to, again, thanks to Lauda and the support crew for the great work on putting the webinars together and also to Mark and James um, who had the idea, uh, we had the idea to come out with these webinars originally we thought in person, but then we moved to an online format given the COVID situation. However, we might have the opportunity to do it live at the Urban Transitions Conference. Um, James and Mark, if you're online, I'm not sure whether you would like to add something um, else before we wrap up. Maybe not. I don't just th thanks to our Alan and look forward to 
uh, in, engaging with um, as many of you who can make it at the, the next session later today. And um, thanking goodbye to all those um, who were just able to join us for uh, this session. All right, thank you. And then that for those in um, Australia, like me or New Zealand, if you register for this next session, then you will get the link. Um, however, we will be posting the links, um, I believe, in the IS Global website, but we will keep you informed. Um, but you, you will have the information uh, for the second session if you cannot make it. So thank you very much to all the speakers and to all the participants. Uh, have a good day or a good evening or night. Thanks.